You just keep doing your best and I will do the rest. Cause I love you, love you, Betty, like I do. Y'all don't understand why I um I walked into the my my second bedroom right now and, and the whole while I was in there trying to get your hat tits all sideways, trying to get myself together. And I just keep saying, singing that that one line that Betty Wright, you just keep doing your best and I will do the rest. And it, it made me sing that in reference to yesterday's show. And it's just so funny how things are so subjective and left up to interpretation because I, I woke up this afternoon from a nap and even last night to so many of you guys' um, well wishes. And y'all were saying, you know, oh, last night's show was fire. Last night's show was so good. And then a lot of comes like last night's show was everything. And, and it's weird because I got up from this chair last night um, feeling like I came back to work too soon. I got up feeling like I came back to work too soon. I got up feeling like I didn't present well last night. I got up feeling like I looked a hot, dusty mess um last night and i got up feeling like i didn't give it my best and it's just so weird because not even just last night but um there have been across my entire youtube career times where i make videos and i be like uh i didn't do good and those be the ones that y'all love the most so I just want y'all to know that I, I felt very um, good. You know, I came back when I came back more so out of obligation. It was like, you know, damn, you've been gone as long as you have. Like, you you, 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 you can't be gone too damn long. Your show going to fall apart. Get your ass back to work. So it just makes me feel good that even – in me considering the fact that I didn't give it my all last night or it didn't feel like my all, that y'all still enjoyed it. You just keep doing your best and I will do the rest. And I'm going to tell you too, I looked at the numbers this morning and I was like, who are these people who just have time to sit down and listen to somebody talk for two hours? <laughs> I just knew last night's show was going to have the lowest. Uh, everybody keeps asking me what song it is. That's After the Pain, After the Pain by Betty Wright. And the part of the song that I'm singing happens at the very, very end of the song. You just keep doing your best and I will do the rest. Cause I love you, love you, Betty, like I do. That's why I still love you after the pain. Anywho, let's get this thing started. Y'all, we got a very, very interesting story. Um, an Indianapolis woman, black mom, Indianapolis black mother who admitted to smothering her two-year-old while high on meth has been found not guilty. Let me read that again. An Indianapolis black mother who admitted to smothering her two-year-old while high on meth found not guilty. Somebody put whitefish. No, she was black. She was black. I, I got to read it one more time for the people in the bike. Who, an Indianapolis black mother who admitted to smothering her two-year-old while high on meth, found not guilty. And she was black like this and not like this, okay? 
And here is what's funny about these stories. They always put black people in a psychological conundrum, right? They put us in a psychological conundrum because we have become so accustomed to the scales of justice not being fair when it comes to us that when the legal system actually works the way it's supposed to, to the point where it sets one of our own free for a crime that they should be guilty of, um, we be baffled. And listen, listen closely. The judge said, after looking at the autopsy and the medical records of the child, that there was no proof of ongoing or long-term abuse. And you know how they always look for bones that have been fractured and healed over time. And the judge says, um, in short, it's the DA's fault that she was charged with the wrong thing that she should have been charged with involuntary manslaughter and that the charge in which she was given, which my assumption is one of those degrees of murder, my assumption, um, not my assumption, he says that in order to be charged with one of those, you have to prove criminal intent. And I'm guessing that her being high off of meth removes the burden of criminal intent. I'm guessing that's where he's going with it. And then, y'all, because of double jeopardy, you know, laws, she can't be tried again for this crime. So in short, you know, um, this black woman um, has been set free after admittedly smothering her two-year-old. Now, it's funny because what are we to do in this moment? Are we to celebrate, especially considering how many injustices that we receive in the law, are we to celebrate, murder aside, are we to celebrate woo-hoo, you know, this, the justice system worked in our favor for once um, or not? You know, it, it's funny because, you know, with people just being people, with us being parents, us being the people that we are, there's no way in hell we're going to ever celebrate the fact that this girl got off with murder, although I could honestly see other groups doing, doing so. Um, but I do believe that some people are more conscientious than others. And while she may have gotten away with it on paper, psychologically, she is going to be in prison until the day she rots in hell. Um, that's just the short that, that that that's just the short of it. Um, her life will not be pleasant whatsoever. Um, and whereas a lot of people saying she got away with murder, uh, I see a situation where her suffering is probably going to be worse than that had she gone to prison. And that's just the way my mind works. I think her suffering being free will be worse than her suffering had she gone to prison because the guilt alone is going to eat her up, which probably will lead her back to drugs. Moving right along. Uh, Y'all have been wanting me to talk about the Houston mama who left her two-year-old kids alone while she went on a cruise. And, 
you know, the story is a little dated. I think the children were eight and six, something of something of that measure. I didn't I didn't take the time this this evening to go and, and pull the story and everything. But here is where I wanted to pivot the conversation and offer of both of these stories. A lot of people want to scream, lock up the mamas, lock up the mamas. How could they? How could they? How could they? And now I think it's a fine time for us to have a conversation about male responsibility when it comes to these children. I think now is a fine time for us to have a conversation about male responsibility. Um, Men, black men, I, I can't speak on other men because I don't know other men. I can just speak on black men. It has become common practice in the black community for men to totally abandon families, children, and households under the auspices of the kids with the mama, they'll be all right. Oh, that's the mama responsibility. I pay my child support. But the burden is still on the mamas. Um, Tupac said, there's no way I could pay you back, but my plan is to show you that I understand. You know, I appreciate. Um, with how hard life is and has become, and with some people being in positions where they don't have help, I can understand why a young person can be overwhelmed and be like, fuck this shit, I'm finna go on this cruise. I can understand why a younger person, especially considering how feeble mind these young people are, I can understand why one of them would be like, girl, fuck them kids, I'm finna go on a cruise. Now, I just wish the fuck them kids I'm finna go on a cruise would have came at 16 and 14 because then I would have been able to be like, y'all, this really ain't much of a story. Um, and not eight and four. Um, but I can begin to understand it. But whereas a lot of people want to take this as an opportunity to beat down the moms and beat down the women, I think we need to just start talking about what is the male responsibility in all of this and what can be done, excuse me. And what could be done legally to set things in place to make sure that men take on a more present and active role in children's lives. And the thing about it is, as, as I sit down and try to ponder through it, I don't really think that there's much that you can do legally. And, and it does suck, right? Because a woman will never be able to detach from children as easily as a man, a man can. No matter how bad of a mother or how bad she didn't want the children I mean, we, we see situations where, you know, women will sit up and mistreat the child for 18 years before they just throw it to the wolves. You know, um, I, I, can, I can only imagine what it does to someone to have something grow in their stomach and then to think about neglecting it. Whereas men, for whatever reason, not any of the men I know. Not any of the men in my family. Let me just throw that out there. But men who are just so easily able to 
turn their back on children that they've created have always baffled me. It's just always baffled me. Like, how do you know you got a child across town and you don't even know how it's doing? You don't care to visit it. You don't care to, to go to any of the doctor's appointments, to be a part of any of the developmental milestones of the child. And that's just always been baffling to me. But it's one of the unique features of um, being able to be a man. Uh, I guess it's biological. I guess it's natural. I guess you find it in nature as well that men are just able to walk away and and not not feel anything, whereas women get stuck with the children. They always say, uh, mommy's babies, daddy's babies. Uh, and I guess that's how that goes. Um, let's lighten things up a little bit. Still in a dark area. Florida bans mandatory water and shade breaks for construction, farm, and other outdoor workers. And this was a bill signed by none other than Rob DeSantis, who, um, so let me give y'all a little bit of background on this story. Um, Miami-Dade County, where I live, um, they were the ones fighting for mandatory water breaks for construction, uh, labor, or construction farm, and outdoor workers. And um, rightfully so. I mean, granted, I grew up in Miami and not other parts of Florida, but it gets hot as all hell in Florida. And for those who can't see what's up under the veil, Ron DeSantis's response to this is a direct response to the immigrant, illegal immigrant issue, you know, for somebody who had to drop out of the presidential race because they straight up and flat out suck, it's very baffling to me that he is still holding on to these talking points that Donald Trump introduced to the political conversation. Um, he's still just going like at this point, what are you going for? You can't be reelected as governor. There's no chance in hell you'll ever be the president. W why are you still going, going, going now? Florida has already taken a major hit when he did the first little thing he did about arresting folks who got immigrants living in their houses. And then we saw a major influx or outflux of people leaving the state and all the construction, all the farming, all those projects we're talking about, you know, people's homes being built were going to be delayed because all of the workers were gone because all of the workers fell under the category of migrant workers or illegal aliens or whatever the politically incorrect word is we're using this week. I just never understood somebody who lacked diplomacy to the point where they were willing to let everything around them crumble and burn in order to prove a point. Now, this is one of the few times where DeSantis's argument, if you were looking for an out, um, if you were looking for an out, you can somewhat side with his out. And the out that he used was the reason that he signed this bill was because of the 44 counties in Florida, Miami-Dade County was the only people having an issue with this. And basically nobody else was making any noise about it. And he didn't want to set off a chain reaction of, of other counties, you know, following suit with Miami-Dade County. And basically Miami-Dade County needs to figure this thing out or let it alone because it's not an issue. And 
I mean, that's just the most non-compassionate leadership because if anything, Miami-Dade County should be applauded. They should be applauded. They should be applauded that they're able to say, despite of the immigrant immigration issue that we are having, immigration issue, alien status aside, people are still human. And if you're going to have them working outside doing these types of jobs, that there should be mandatory water breaks and shade restrictions for these types of people. Now, here's the other, here's the other thing. It's sad to me that we live in a world where this is not even something that we can self-regulate as people or employers. You know what I'm saying? It, 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 it is sad that, um, Let me back up. I used to always say about people in these situations when they be like, oh, the male male person uh, dies of heat stroke in Houston from delivering mail and sweltering heat. I used to always kind of suck my teeth and get an attitude because I, 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 I would say to myself, what type of stupid ass adult would keep walking up and down the street to the point of them being about to pass out. Like, why wouldn't you just stop? And why wouldn't your survival instincts just say, fuck this job? But then I have to dial it back and say, you know what, Q, you, you know, perhaps you've just never been placed in whatever psychological or mental situation said person has been put in to keep going. Um, I know me. I don't know about y'all wide bike holes, but there is nothing that you could do that's going to make me keep working when I feel like my body about to give out and I need some water and something to drink. That's why I know I wouldn't have been a good slave. What the song say? Uh, the old Negro spiritual, I'd rather go to my grave before I be a slave. Baby, I had to go, I'd had to go to my grave because I know it just wouldn't have worked. I'm sitting in here now with, with a prayer cloth over my knees because it's 69 degrees in my house. Um, baby, I knew I had to go to college, bitch, because if I had to end up with a blue-collar job that would have required me to be outside, it just wouldn't have worked, honey. Plumbing wasn't going to work. Electrician wasn't going to work. ACAV wasn't going to work. Police officer wasn't going to work. Firefighter, EMT, correction officer, that wasn't going to work. Park ranger wasn't going to work. Lifeguard wasn't going to work. Telephone uh, pole wasn't going to work. Light pole wasn't going to work. Tow truck driver wasn't going to work. Delivery mail was not going to work. Driving for UPS or FedEx was not going to work. Being a school teacher, elementary school age, having to take the kids outside was not going to work. Working at a daycare center, taking the kids outside was not going to work. Working in the kitchen, cooking was not going to work. Driving a school bus was not going to work. Driving the county bus with the door open and then closing where I'm sitting at was not going to work. Y'all don't understand. Um, those, and y'all think I'm laughing. Y'all think I'm laughing. And, 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 and I hate to even say this out loud. And I'm not saying it from a place of shade. I just knew that a lot of blue collar work was not going to work for me because I liked air condition. And that truly was just, that truly was one of the largest driving forces in me going to college. A lot of y'all said the different world was a driving force and all these different things. It's the biggest driving force and my gay sissy faggoty ass not going uh, going to college was the fact that the only two choices in my mind was office or outside, and I just knew that I was better suited to be in the office. <laughs> okay, I was going to be secretarial office fish all day long. I just that's. That is the way my brain processed it. And I'm not discrediting anyone. All jobs are important to make society go around. I just knew that 
they wasn't important enough for me to be outside, <laughs> okay? Now, you can go be outside. I don't know how y'all made me raise y'all. I don't know what y'all beliefs was. I don't know the way y'all melanin was set up to deal with the sun. I just knew that mine was not going to allow me to be no security guard sitting in that little hut having to get out and write people tag numbers down as they went in and out the office park because it was too goddamn hot. It was just simply too hot. How gay is that? That somebody based their whole decision on going to college because they knew they wasn't finna work outside. And if I have to tell y'all where that came from, if I have to tell y'all where that came from, um, I have PTSD from being a young child and my daddy waking us up early in the morning and making us go outside and like do um, yard work. Like we would, we would get outside and we would be out there four and five hours in the morning, cutting the yard, washing the porch, spraying down the house, washing the cars, uh, picking the weeds, uh, cleaning the driveway, all that type of stuff. And I hated it. And I used to cry internally. And I just knew when I grew up, I just knew it made me despise doing any type of physical labor. Labor. It made me despise being getting my hands dirty. It made me despise being outside, taking in groceries. It just made me, it, it sent me to, and I'm not being funny. I'm, I'm being so for real here. It sent me to the other end of the spectrum when it comes to like doing outside stuff. I just knew that when I grew up, I had to make enough money where I didn't have to do nothing outside. And that is the true T. I just knew when I grew up, I, I couldn't do nothing outside. It just, it, it just was not going to work. And we had our mandatory water breaks and shade breaks and we didn't need the government to regulate the regulate hours we was able to drink all the damn water we wanted but baby, we was outside for them three hours four hours at the top of the damn day um doing yard work i, I don't fucking around and got mad now the damn man in the grave let me move on um the student slapping the teacher so there were two things that I knew that I knew for a fact when it came to the student slapping the teacher. When it came to the student slapping the teacher, I knew that the student was white. And y'all don't kill me for this. I knew that the student was white or I knew that the student was a black female when I heard the story. And that's based on nothing outside of typically that's what it's been when I looked down to the Instagram. I was very, 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 very disappointed um, regardless of race, creed, and color, I was disappointed. But when I saw the boy that was doing it, I was like, whoa. And it's one thing for us to have the conversation about disrespectful children uh, and for us to weigh in. And then it's just another for us to see the visual representation to that extent. Um. What happened? 
And what and what I mean by what happened is what happened to society. Uh, you are not going to get me to believe that laws and disciplinary actions in schools have changed so much from the time that we were in school till now that this is a legal and a school board issue because it's not it, 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 it it's not um teachers i graduated i graduated in 2001 teachers didn't have the right to put their hands on us back then and cuss us out without getting in trouble even though they did and nothing has changed now which means if it's not on the schools and it's not on the law, then it's on the parent. Now, here is where the difficult part comes in at. I'm 40 years old. A lot of people have their kids in their early 20s, mid 20s. Which means that these children who are currently in high school um, beating up these teachers, they belong to my cohort. They belong to me, my classmates, the class of 96, the class of 95, these kids belong to the class of 93, you know, up until class of 2007. And we like to walk around and pride ourselves on being like the last of the we played outside generation. I have to ask us, where did we go wrong? And is it something that we, we consciously don't see? Because I know that me and my friends don't have conversations about soft parenting. I know that me and my friends like to think that we parent our children similarly to the way our parents parented us. But if I'm being honest, if you are between the ages of 35 and like 48, these children belong to us. So there's a conversation um, that needs to be had. Where did we go wrong? And it's weird and it's baffling because we are the main ones, this age cohort, we are the main ones consuming this level of news and expressing this level of disgust, but they're our kids. So I see a lot of y'all saying, not mine, girl, not mine, not mine either, and not any other ones in my family, because I come from a good family. I don't come from no raggedy, rundown, prison bound family like some of y'all. And we still put our foot off in the, in the asses of our children. But comedy aside, comedy aside, there's something that went wrong with our collective raising of our children. Um, and if I have to begin, if I have to begin to start pinpointing where some of it came from, I think some of it came from um, ain't nobody going to put their hands on my child. I think I think some of it comes from that attitude. Ain't nobody going to put their hands on my child. 
I think some of it came from that. And as a matter of fact, now that I think about it, some of that started with our parents. Because I can remember certain people's parents coming to the school, cussing out the teachers, talking about, ain't nobody finna talk to my child any type of way. Ain't nobody finna put their hand on my child. And I think that once parents started undermining teachers in front of children, this whole... Don't say nothing to my child. Don't touch my child. Don't take my child's cell phone. You call me and I discipline my child when they get home, which would have been fine and well if you actually would have disciplined your child when you got home and not been tongue-in-cheek with the teacher and cussed the teachers out. Um, I think that that's where some of it started. Granted, we don't have the time to sit here and dissect the whole thing. But I think that's where some of it started, where a lot of it started, as a matter of fact. And then from there, the rope just continued to, to un, un, unwind, 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 unwind. Um, as much as I have my disdain for religion, um, I don't think that people and children sit in... Um, very churchy like communities anymore. And one thing that I will remember from going to church relatively often as a child, when you grow up in a church centric community, when you grow up in a church centric community, you become accustomed to taking direction and instruction from anybody that's grown. Okay. And any older authority figure could say anything to you in any tone using any word and you ate it and you had no choice but to eat it and your mama and your grandfather and your auntie or whoever could have been around the corner cleaning chicken for the past the appreciation party later on that night and <clears throat> And they would not have said a damn thing why Deaconess Brown or Brother Long was correcting the children who were running out round outside or misbehaving in vacation Bible school. So you've got that. You've also got, you know, I'm on a roll now, now that my brain is thinking. You also got what I also think part of the problem is, too. I think that when we started having children so young, when we started having children so young, I'm talking about 15-year-olds and 17-year-olds and 18-year-olds and having children, that there was not a gap created large enough between child and adult where the child understood that the adult was an authority figure and you had respect for them by virtue of them being an adult. Because you and your mama is listening to the same music. You and your mama is listening to the same music. And now y'all are, are psychological equals. I will never forget. We was in line at McDonald's on 183rd and 27th Avenue. And this was the year that Ghost Town DJs, my boo came out. At night, I think of you. I want to be, y'all know that song. My mama had just paid for the food at window number one. And we were sandwiched in between about two cars in front of us on our way to window number three. And Ghost Town DJs, my boo came on and I reached for the radio to turn the song up. My mama allowed me to turn the volume up, but she looked at me. And she said, I don't understand why you like this song so much. And it's so funny the things that imprint on your brain. Because I remember looking at her like, Ma, this is the song of a lifetime. Even now at 40 years old, Ghost Town DJs, My Boo is everything. And I remember her looking at me saying, I don't know why you like this song so much. And the look of disgust on her face was so pronounced. 
The point that I'm making is it pointed out a distinct generational difference between us. My mother also thought that Mary J. Blige could not sing and that she was trash. My mama thought that Mary J. Blige could not sing and was a trash artist. And I'm simply saying all of this to point out that there was enough generational gap between us that my mama didn't get it. My mother had me at 30. My mother had me at 30. So I say that to say, if you and your children are both in the car singing, bend that ass over, let that coochie breathe, you're probably part of the problem. If your 16-year-olds are in the car, like, singing Lotto and, and NLE Chopper and, and Da Baby this and Sue Baby that and Zuki Uki this, and you're singing right along with them, no shade, and you're probably not doing it intentionally, but you're kind of probably like part of the problem. Because in theory, there should be enough generational gap between you and your children that y'all don't like the same trends. Now, my theory is not necessarily foolproof because we was in the car singing the things that our parents were singing and it was the shit, but it was just a little different. My theory got a, my theory got a little bit of flaws and it's a little faulty and we'll figure it out later. We ain't got time. We got to move on to the next thing. You know what I'm saying? But, but, those that understand, understand. Those that understand, understand. Things is just different. You shouldn't be singing, being that ass over there, that coochie read with your children. And you and your children, my mama raised me right. My mama don't know the lyrics to my boo. Okay? My mama don't know the lyrics to my boo. And if you 40 years old, your mama shouldn't know the lyrics to my boo either. And if you, if he, let me stop. Let me, let me stop. Let me stop while I'm here because I'm about to offend some of y'all mammies. But if you 40 years old, your mama shouldn't know the lyrics to my boo. And let me get back on track. To my point, because there was not enough generational gap, I think some of these children don't see adults as adults, don't see adults as authority figures. <laughs> because even when I was in college, I couldn't bring myself to even talk to no teacher like that. I'm 40 years old with gray hair. By all means, I have license to speak to any adult any way I want to at this point. I have gained enough tenure in this life to talk to any age person any way I want. And honestly and truthfully, still based on the way I was raised, as much shit as I talk, as much as I say I cuss out elderly people, if it's an older older person, especially an older black person, older black woman, older black man, and, you know, they, they chastising me or correcting me in public, I'm probably just going to go along with it. At best, I'm going to roll my eyes, but I'm probably just going to go along with it. I mean, they would just have to be, they would just have to be downright, like, just disrespectful to the point where it was like now bitch I got to say I got to cuss your ass out now nah. but like if, if I if I was somewhere and you know um you know just just for an example you know uh a, 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 a elderly woman walked up to me and granted I don't wear my pants sagging but she would have said to me you know young man you need to pull your pants up or you need to turn that hat around or or you don't need to use that type of language like that in public I'm probably gonna say yes ma'am Miss Jones 
or I'm sorry, man. Oh, miss, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, ma'am. That probably is going to be my response with all this gray hair in my damn head, in my damn face. Y'all saw Mickey Howard got on the line and I, I knew that it was probably all right for me to call her Mickey. But I was like, you know, I still sat out there and said, you know, Miss Howard, Miss Mickey, what would, that's that's about the best you're going to get me to do when it kind of disrespecting somebody older than me. I might call them by their first name, but put Miss in front of it. Like, I do this thing that I always imagine what it's going to be like when I do my, my very first Oprah Winfrey interview. Like, I don't feel comfortable sitting on the chair calling her Oprah. You know, and Oprah this. It is going to be my first instinct to call her Miss Winfrey. It's going to be my first instinct to call her Miss Winfrey. And then if she looks uncomfortable with Miss Winfrey, I'm probably going to go on to call her Miss Oprah. I'm going to be like, oh, Miss Oprah. And she's probably going to have to tell me two times or whatever, please just call me Oprah before I feel comfortable doing it. Funny story, and I'm going to move right along. When I was in Candy's play, Tyler Perry came to see the play, and Tyler Perry happened to be a little late to the play, and I guess for security reasons, they didn't want to bring him through the main entrance. Tika Sumter was Tyler Perry's date that night. I had just come off stage doing a scene, and I needed to run backstage and change my costume before my next scene. Tyler Perry grabbed my arm and said, my hair is laid like. And I said, oh, my God, thank you so much, Mr. Perry. And then I had to shake loose from him and run backstage to, to, to finish changing my uniform so I could get out on stage before my next scene. That just goes to show how ingrained in the older generation that it is for us to default to a place of deference and not be um, so, you know, out of, out of, out of eye, eye level with adults. You, you know, y'all don't, y'all don't think I've lived in these entertainment streets. I got stories. I got stories. I got some stories in these streets. Um, moving right along. Like we're gonna run over tonight. Lisa Ray got her light skinned ass over there in Bali with Russell Simmons. Um, I gotta be honest, I don't like it. I don't like it. And I don't like it not because it's Russell Simmons. I don't like it because it's Lisa Ray. It's something about when I see Lisa Ray with a man, any man, it's giving ill intention. It's giving dating for money. It's giving looking for my next check. There is something about Lisa Ray's demeanor, and I don't know this woman from Adam, despite the fact that we were on the same network. I was only on a Zoom call with Lisa Ray once or twice, and we never had a personal exchange, full disclosure. But there is just something about whenever Lisa Ray pops up on the television or on in the media with a man, it's always given she's looking for her next come up. Now, I realize that I walk into the situation carrying a bias 
And I'm not, I don't have my hair too far up my ass or I can't strip that bias back and be like, Q, for all you know, they've been friends for 30 something years and and that's just her good friend. You know what I'm saying? Which it, 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 which it very well could be. Um, but it just don't feel right when I look at it. And that, that's really all I can say about it. Now, there's something else that I want to mention. I find it peculiar. I find it peculiar that now all of a sudden Russell Simmons now has these high profile or, or at least I'm going to call these very high profile, Usher's high profile, but that Russell Simmons now all of a sudden has these celebrity friends that are just visiting him uh, in Bali. Um, it's just something going on. There's just something for us to pay attention to. Or maybe not. Maybe it's none of our business and there's nothing for us to pay attention to. But there's just something that feels a little off kilter. Now these celebrities are popping up in Bali, visiting Russell Simmons, and, and, and letting the pictures come to social media so we can know that they're there visiting with Russell Simmons. There's just something there for us to pay attention to. There's a larger play at hand. I don't know what the play is. But there is a larger play at hand. Now, where Russell gonna go wrong is if Diddy ass pop up over there. Now, as much as Russell Simmons is soliciting celebrity friends right now, do y'all think he'd be open to Diddy visiting him? Or do y'all think he'd be like, uh-uh, brother, the block is too hot? And I only ask that because if Russell Simmons would not be open to Diddy visiting him, that would so be the pot calling the kettle black. So be the pot calling the kettle black. Oh, they say, can Diddy lead the, D the U.S. right now? He probably can't. They saying Russell ain't got no money. He probably got a... Y'all will be surprised. I watch enough Blacklist to know Ramey Reddington had accounts, baby, all over the Swiss, the Philippines, and Philadelphia. He had... <clears throat> Y'all need to watch Blacklist and find out where these people keep their money. Moving right along, honey. Shine say he ain't shoot nobody. What he said was, we all knew that I was the fall guy. Um... So I'm going to be honest with y'all. I don't know what I was doing during that era of my life. Or maybe I just simply just wasn't interested. I don't, I don't in particular remember all the ins and outs of Shine going to jail, the, the Diddy thing. All I remember, I remember J-Lo in that Versace dress. I remember they went out later that night. I remember J-Lo, Diddy, and Shine got arrested. There was a shooting. J-Lo broke up with Diddy, and she wasn't messing with Black people no more, and she emerged to be a pop star that catered to white and Latin audiences. That's what I remember. I don't remember much about the lady being shot in the face. I don't remember much about the bullet fragment still being in the lady face. I don't remember much about the lady going around saying that Diddy was the one that shot her. I don't remember any of that. Um, but those are the details. Um, 
you know, Sean says we all know he was the fall guy, but there are also rumors that you allowed Sean allowed it to go down in exchange for his family being taken care of because it would seem to me that just like with this Tory Lanez thing, if you didn't shoot her, then say who did. Um, but I guess a lot of people, some of y'all are saying they paid the lady off. Did they pay the lady off? Because the lady is going around saying that she been hollering that Diddy shot her in the face for the longest while. Um so again, I I I I I don't I don't know all the ins and outs, so I'm not gonna pretend to, but but the shit is coming to the surface now. And the lady want the, the lady wants to be vindicated because she's like, I've been talking and nobody was listening to me for all these years. And now, you know, I'm, you know, now y'all see the monster that he is. And, and, and here's what's funny. Hindsight is always 2020 because had something been done or had we peeped Diddy's aura and energy back then, then maybe we wouldn't be dealing with the Diddy that we're dealing with right now. Um, I can't even begin to fathom that he shot the lady in the face on purpose. Now, I I, I can't begin to fathom that. I I I I ooh. Um, I, I'm hoping the true story goes in trying to shoot back at whoever he thought was shooting at them. And he accidentally shot the damn lady in the face. I refuse to believe um, that he looked the lady in her face and shot her. I hope not. Um, nevertheless, um, that's what the people say was going on with that. And then they say Diddy was hunching Carl Winslow in the boogie. That man and his wife. Y'all, y'all be getting this little chapstick like this. It's cute, but they need to make something that roll it, that push it up. Because when you digging your finger in it, it get under your nails. Like boo-boo when you wiping your butt and it break through the toilet paper, then that boo-boo, that boo-boo be under your nail bed. But y'all boo-boo and y'all man boo-boo because not my boo-boo. That man and his girlfriend was on that talk show and said that Diddy was hunching. The Family Matters daddy, Officer Carl Winslow in the boogie, and was hunching him real hard. Was hunching him hard and said he was in there moaning and hollering like a hyena. And said that he was hitting him from the back and said that they was at Diddy House and when they heard the noise like that, they broke, they kicked the door down. They kicked the door down, broke, broke down in the door and when they broke the door open, all they saw was Carl Winslow look back while Diddy was fucking him from the back. And then they said that Diddy, Diddy ran out and said that, you know, all is cool, it's all well, that um, it's nothing like being able to get a man to do things for money. And... I was like, ooh, there's a lot to unpack here, right? So, I'm trying to, in my head, put the Diddy. Let me start out by saying, I don't think I believe it. It's no secret that Carl Winslow is gay. That is a that's that is a known fact that Reginald Vale Thomas is gay. That's known, it's out there. So that's not a big deal. What I'm trying to place on my chronological timeline is the rise of Puff Daddy. The rise of Puff Daddy, 
the exit of Carl Winslow from our television? And would there have been enough relevancy for Carl Winslow by the time Diddy became Diddy that they would even be in the same room? Follow me. Diddy, Puff Daddy, P. Diddy, Brother Love. I guess the question I'm asking is, when did he become Star Island home owning Diddy? Because Family Matters went off the air when? And by, I, I'm, I'm willing to say, uh, you know, Diddy became Star Island Diddy, you know, in the early 2000s, maybe. That's when he became like, woo, my, my name really got some weight in these streets. I could go around sleeping with people and doing whatever I want to do. That's when he became Diddy. I, I, I just... I, I, I don't know. And maybe I'm putting way too much thought into this, which I think I am. Um, I just don't think that, I just don't think that Diddy was somewhat hunching Reginald Vale Lewis. Do, do y'all, do y'all think, I just don't think that, and like somebody put in the comments, unlikely pair. They say family matters ended in 98. Okay. If family matters ended in 98, Carl Winslow would have still carried a, rele a, a certain amount of TV relevancy, at least for the next five years. So that would have took him 99, 2000, 2001, 2002, 2003. I mean, all right, Sony, I, mean, I guess it is kind of likely that Diddy was Diddy during that time where Carl Winslow was invited to the parties back then, but I, uh, I'm just not believing it. I, I'm just... I'm just not, not believing it. I'm not, I'm not believing it. And, 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 and I'm going to take it a step further. I don't think Diddy is as gay. I don't think Diddy is as gay as people trying to make him out to be me personally. I don't think he's as gay uh, as people trying to make him out to be. You know, he went from being a predator. Now he now he hunching every doggone man in the industry and it's been kept under wraps for all the years. Has he hunched a man? Sure. Has he hunched a, hunched a couple men? Perhaps. Did he hunch that daddy from Family Matters? He didn't hunch that daddy. He didn't hunch that daddy. They saying, I keep saying the man name, like, well, well, child, I'm implicated. What's it, Reginald Vale Thomas or Vale Lewis? Hunching big, bad Carl. Don't, don't. Carl Lewis was one of the most, Carl, Lord, Lord, I don't implicate it, the Olympic running man. Carl Winslow was one of the most unattractive black TV dads. Diddy wasn't hunching that old man. Reginald Bell Johnson. Well, I'm sorry to the family of Reginald Bell Lewis. I didn't mean to um, implicate y'all family member. But since the spirit and the ancestors led me to say it, and since Diddy a whole lot of gay, according to all of y'all, he probably was hunching him, Bell Lewis, Bell Johnson, and Bell Thompson in the ass too. Y'all will not, but you know what? Reginald Vale Johnson do favor T.D. Jakes. Let me get off this subject now because it's it's getting bad. It's 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 gonna get real bad, and I don't want to mess with no man of the cloth. And I'm still looking sick, and I'm still feeling sick. This story right here from the crush, some of y'all ghetto hoes. Now, I don't know if they're going anywhere, but Red Lobster gearing up the file bankruptcy, child. They getting ready to file bankruptcy. Some people said in 2022, 
Red Lobster lost, I mean, 2022 or 2023. Overall, Red Lobster had lost $22 million or 30, 22 or $33 million. They was down. And then they then they said that they had ran that special uh $20 all you can eat shrimp for the summer and said that that special alone caused them to lose. Eleven million dollars in one quarter. For those of y'all who didn't go to college and get an office job, a quarter is four months out of the year. I'm sorry, three months out of the year because it's twelve months in the year. Three, six, nine, twelve. So y'all went in there and ate up them people's shrimp from July through September. Y'all went up in there and ate up them people's shrimp from July through September for $20 to the point where <clears throat> them people lost $11 million. Now, I'm going to tell you where Red Lobster went wrong at. Red Lobster went wrong that they didn't hop on a crab boil trend. They went wrong that they didn't that they did not hop on the crab boil trend. Red Lobster already had the infrastructure, and y'all already had the bulk of the products that were required in order to make the crab boil. Red Lobster could have single-handedly prevented all these damn crab boy places from popping up. Now, I don't I don't know about y'all, but down here in Miami and down here in Atlanta, it is a crab boy place every two stoplights. From Juicy Crab to Crappy Crab to Mrs. and Mr. Crab to Hook and Real to a Tasty Crab to uh, Miss Lucy Crab. I mean, it is a crab place every two stoplights. Um, hold on. Now, those of us that know found our way up out the ghetto. You know, we love to do this thing where we say only ghetto people eat red lobster and, you know, once you taste high-quality seafood, you know, you can't go back to eating red lobster. And, you know, it's a fun little internal little black classism joke that we like to tell in the black community. But let's not get it twisted. You know, me personally, I, 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 I'm not above going to Red Lobster. But here is the problem. Every time, me me and my friend, y'all know my TV, TV producer friend, James Knox, every now and again, we'll be like, you want to go on a field trip? We'll be like, yeah, girl, you want to go? We'll be like, bitch, let's just for shits and giggles, let's go to Red Lobster. And we will go to Red Lobster and the food will just be atrocious, just horrible, just horrible. Um, we've gone like twice um, and it's just horrible. Y'all, have our palates changed or has Red Lobster gotten worse since we were younger? I refuse to believe, and, and, and I'll be the first person, I'm a very steak and potatoes type of person. I don't have a very sophisticated palate when it comes to eating out. I refuse to believe my palate has just elevated so much from the time we was going to Red Lobster. Red Lobster is nasty as hell. Okay, it is nasty as hell. And I'm sorry. Judgment alert. I I I am judging people in 2024 who go eat at Red Lobster because I'm like you literally have never been nowhere if you think that Red Lobster tastes good. If you think that Red Lobster, and what Red Lobster don't understand is the reason that y'all losing all this doggone money and y'all need to restructure and all this type of stuff is because your food is bad. Your 
food is bad. Not only is red lobster food bad, Applebee's food is bad, Chili's food is bad, TGI Friday's food is bad, and Cheesecake Factory food is beginning to get bad. It's bad. I am one of those people. I am one of those people that have become a I don't eat at chain restaurants people. I am a I don't eat at chain restaurants person. All right. The exception that I make is for Houston's, Houston's and Hillstone, which is the same company, and occasionally Cheesecake Factory. Outside of that, I don't eat at chain restaurants. Part of it is because I think I'm bougie and I'm nouveau rich. And the other part about it is once you've eaten better, you can't go back to eating that shit. You cannot go back to eating that shit. Now, there are certain things that I can find certain places. If I go to Chili's, I'm getting fajitas. If I go to Applebee's, I'm not getting shit. It ain't shit I'm eating out of Applebee's. It ain't shit I'm eating out of Applebee's. The French fries, maybe. And if I had to find something, maybe a cheeseburger. Um, you know, Outback, I could still eat a blooming onion and a steak from Outback or whatever. Um, TGI Fridays. I go there and get some Parmesan, garlic, garlic Parmesan wings. That's it. That's it. The only thing I'm eating from TGI Fridays is garlic Parmesan wings. That's it. I mean, the quiet as it's kept, even Applebee's and even TGI Fridays fries be bad. Even they fries be bad. So, so I say all that to say, all the fast food places, um, they need to be on major alert, coupled with the fact that people are moving towards more nutritious meal options, more quality meal options. You know, people are moving towards more quality meal options. Um... People trying to live. People don't want all this cancer. We can now... Oh, P.F. Chang's been nasty. Oh, P.F. Chang's been nasty. Listen, I, I, I never, I never, ever, ever was a P.F. Chang's girl, ever. Now, I, I would go there and get the, the chicken lettuce wraps. But, baby... I eat out a dirty Chinese place on the corner, on the corner of the block before I eat out of PF Chang's. PF Chang's been nasty. Quiet as it's kept, they might have set the trend off of nasty food. Them hoes been nasty. They ooh, they been nasty. They been nasty. It's some of y'all in the comments saying Popeyes don't went down. Um, Longhorn still good. Longhorn still got it going on. Longhorn still got it going on. Listen, I'm gonna just put it this way. If the steak, if the steak less than, than $40. If the steak less than $40, um, you probably don't want it. I am Latavia. Stop asking me what's going on with Carlos King. I don't know. I, I don't know what's going on with Carlos. I saw some of y'all put something in the chat about Carlos and Heavenly. I didn't bother going to check it out. We talking about fast food right now. Uh, I grew up in Miami and I lived in Atlanta. I don't know what Logan's is. I'm sorry. Ooh, Panda Express, nasty. All of it is nasty because all of it is frozen. And the, the, the conversation that we honestly need to be having is that what, we live in a capitalistic society. I get it. I understand, you know, profit margins and we, to make as much money as possible. But 
Our government does not protect its people when it comes to food. Food is one of those things that just should not be capitalized. And if it has to be capitalized, it should be capitalized very slowly. I find it very peculiar that you go out of the country and there are bans on the things that we are allowed to be served in the United States. I Now, it, 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 it's funny because you would think that politically, you know, countries, we, we may not be able to agree on economics and, and, and social policy, so on and so forth. But you would think that food and math would be universal. You would think that food and math would be universal. You would think that there would be some type of guide that says, well, if Europe found this inappropriate to feed its people, then maybe we need to take a look at it. If this place said it's not good to drink high fructose corn syrup, then maybe we should take a look at it. But the way the United States works is our senators been on been the people who own the damn cornfields, who subsequently own the high fructose corn syrup production industry. Therefore, we're going to continue pumping our people full of high fructose corn syrup. Chav. Um, uh, two last things. I'm gonna let y'all out of here. Um, y'all said y'all wanted me to talk about WM WNBA pay disparities. I don't know what's going on in particular, but I would imagine, I would imagine something came out with people's wages being revealed, or something came out, you know, with their facilities being subpar compared to their male counterparts. Or something came out where the disparities are being highlighted. Um, I've touched on this before, and I hate to sound insensitive. Um, the WNBA doesn't rake in, not even just the WNBA. Nobody, ooh, why do y'all put me in these situations? All right. Here's the classy based way of saying it. Women's sports is very niched. All right. Women's sports is very niched. There is just a small amount of people who enjoy watching and participating in women's sports. Women don't even, women, women don't even watch women's sports. So it's funny, right? Because like, this is one of those topics where I'm going to give a little pushback before we even begin to compare WNBA players to NBA players. And before we begin to ask questions and make comparisons to male leagues, this is one of those situations well, I'm going to stay out of women's business because y'all love to throw that shit around when it's convenient. Stay, they, they need to stay out of women's business. Before we have a conversation and before we try to do this whole protect women thing and they need to be paid more, before that comes out of any woman's mouth, what I need you to answer is, why is it that every Sunday you will sit down and cook food and, and, and watch a Dallas Cowboys game with your husband or every Tuesday night be down to watch a Miami Heat game with your husband, but you, your girlfriends, your sorority sisters, your co-workers, your, your knitting group, Y'all don't sit down and come together as women and collectively watch women's sports. And it's simple. It's a, it's a very simple answer. It's because you, you know socialization, indoctrination. But nobody gives a damn about females playing sports outside of like tennis, which we have deemed a, a gender neutral sport. No one cares. 
It's not exciting. It's not enthusiastic. And maybe it's one of those vestiges of patriarchy. We are taught that women are supposed to wear dresses and play with baby dolls. All right. We don't want to see bull dagger looking women running up and down the damn court, dribbling a ball. We just don't. It's misogynistic as fuck. It's patriarchal as fuck. And I don't make the rules. I'm just telling y'all what drives the attitudes behind why people don't watch women's sports. No one's enthusiastic about it. I'm 40 years old. I've never seen a, a group of my girlfriends be like, ooh, bitch. Uh, ooh, bitch. We got to get an outfit. We finna go to the WNBA game this weekend. Nobody cares. It's an ugly, hard truth. Nobody cares. We'll watch women in tennis. We'll watch them in track and field. We will watch them in gymnastics. That's it. That's it. That's it. Don't get mad at me for saying the shit how it is. That's it. It's patriarchy. It's misogyny. It, uh, it's taking my cue. You so loud and so wrong this time. About what? Don't nobody watch the shit. If them hoes, I don't want to call them hoes. If them bull daggers brought, I don't want to call them bull daggers. <laughs> if them very masculine women, if them very masculine women that tend to wear shorts and tennis shoes more than they do dresses, if they packed the stands the same way male sports did, then we could be having a conversation about pay disparities and why they get paid so less. Ain't nobody watching that shit. I ain't never in my lifetime on ABC, NBC, CBS, or Fox at 8 o'clock during any day of the week, during any day of my life, see a WNBA game played. I ain't never in my life. You know how sometimes you and your family get ready to go out to eat? And then y'all get to a restaurant and don't re realize why so many cars out there. And then somebody be like, oh, it's a game tonight. I ain't never went to no parking lot to go eat at Red Lobster, but had to park all the way down there by the Old Navy. Because when we got there, it was like, oh, crap, everybody in here because the WNBA game going on tonight. I ain't never been able to not get in Hooters because the WNBA game was on that night. Come on, y'all. Tell the truth. Get out your feelings and get out your coochie. Get out your coochie. Get out your ovaries in this moment and tell the truth. Don't nobody watch that shit. And I'm going to tell you an even harder truth. And don't nobody want to watch that shit, okay? So it's one of them things. <laughs> At this... <laughs> I'm finna make y'all real bad now. At this juncture in life, them WA NBA players would be better off calling themselves transgender men and trying to find their way, break their way into the NBA. The way politics and policy go, <coughs> they'd have a uh, they'd have a better chance calling themselves identifying as transgender men and going and playing in the NBA than they would somebody coming over there giving their ass a whole bunch of money now. Now, I will say this. I will say this. On the college basketball front, things are garnering a lot more popularity. Things are garnering a lot more popularity on the college basketball front, but it's not translating over into the WNBA. You watch and see when Angel Reese and Flaugé and all them leave college, 
the hype and the esteem behind these girls is not going to follow them to the WNBA, or at least history has not shown us that just yet. And if and when it does, I have no problem eating these words and standing corrected. Somebody wrote, Angel was just drafted. Everybody in that bitch was drafted at some point. Let me move on. How y'all feel about Kanye West hitting it? Somebody said, leave it alone, Q. I'm going to leave it alone. I'm going to leave it alone. Leave it alone. Come on, Duranis Pace. Come on, Duranis. God's got it. He said, leave it alone. How that song go, y'all? Leave it alone. Leave it alone. God's got it. Leave it alone. Something like that. Duranis told me to leave it alone. She just, she just whispered in my ear, so I'm going to leave it alone. Anyway, y'all, last on the agenda, Kanye West um, assaulted or punched a man who allegedly sexually assaulted that robot that he dragging around. Um, I know this is going to sound very weird to me. Um, I'm less concerned about, this is going to sound very ugly. I am less concerned about that man groping Kanye West's girlfriend and more concerned about the fact that she let Kanye convince her ass to walk around Disney World with no shoes on. In my opinion, that was the assault. The true assault was her walking around Disney World with them ace bandages wrapped around her feet with nothing protecting her toes, the sole of her feet, or her heel from her stepping on rocks, broken glass, ice, or anything that could puncture the skin. Do you know, I don't want to see the paparazzi pictures of when they were walking around Disney World I want to see the pictures of when they were leaving Disney World. Where them pictures of that dirty, dirty foot, foot dragging ass hoe at? Where them pictures at? Where are them pictures at? I know the soles of her feet had to hurt. I know that her feet had to be black as 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 muck. Disneyland has hundreds of thousands of people. Do you know how many germs on the bottom of her feet? Do you, do you know how much stuff can enter your bloodstream just simply by contact on the skin? And, you know, at one point, I was like, you know, she's the girlfriend and she prides herself on being his muse and all these types of things and you know oh it's a weird relationship but it's not our business we need to just mind our business but at what point do you not stand up for your own damn self and your own damn safety there's no way in hell you was going to get any man to have me walking around anywhere outside with no damn shoes on not to mention the ground is hot not to mention the ground is hot. Not to mention when you at Disney World and stuff, people drop Pepsi products on the ground and stuff all the time. People spit on the ground all the time. Why would you be walking around a fairground? Why would you be walking around a theme park with no shoes on? Kanye, why would you want her to do that? Why, why couldn't that be reserved for a photo shoot? 
had she done that in a photo shoot, it would have been cute. You know, the, the other thing about Kanye always talks about his clothing and so on and so forth. Kanye, your clothing designs are not even functional. You know, they're, Kanye likes to act like he's so creative. Your clothing designs are what we deem futuristic. But in order for us to, in order for them to be deemed futuristic, means that they fit into a category. In order for something to fit into a category means it has to be categorized. In order for something to be categorized, it means we must have seen enough of it in order to create the category. Therefore, Kanye, these clothes that you're creating are just inspirations that your ass took from Star Trek when you was a little damn boy. The shit ain't that damn creative. If there is a box, if there is a box for us to place something in, that means we've seen it before in order to create said box. So how innovative are your Star Trek costumes really? The Jetsons, homeless people, somebody said apocalyptic fashion. All of these fashions that Kanye try to get mad about the big fashion houses don't want to make, we have seen in sci-fi movies. So where is all of this innovation that he's talking about? Not to mention, they're not functional. Who the fuck walking around? First of all, when you go to Disney World, you don't want to have a bag or don't want to have a fanny pack. You need some keys, uh, some pockets to put your key for your locker. You need some pockets to put your credit card in, even if you bring your little wallet. You need your pocket to put your rag in because it's hot out there. Kanye, who wearing them bandages with no pockets? It's hot out here in the theme park, Kanye. Who finna leave their skin exposed? Forget the theme park. Who finna walk up and down the streets of Miami, New York, LA, Houston with their skin exposed? Part of clothes is to provide protection. You know how many white holes would be sunburned with that shit on, on top of having bloody, dusty, dirty feet? But y'all want to sit up here and act like there's not something mentally wrong with Kanye West. Kanye West asked me to be put in the institution. There I said it. Whatever medication they was giving Britney Spears ass, they need to give it to Kanye. He got the same hips. And they say the hips don't lie. And y'all said Britney ain't doing nothing wrong by rolling her hips and let her dance. Let's just give Kanye some medicine that's going to make him roll his hips and dance. Because while y'all around here worried about Cassie and Daphne Tran and Carisha and all these other people, I'm wondering, is Bianca Sensori being trafficked? It might not be sex trafficking. I, when I went to Florida State University and got my degree in economics, they didn't teach me nothing about the legal system. But it's some type of trafficking that her ass is being. You can't tell me that girl is not in bondage. You, I don't know what type of reverse 12 years of slave relationship they ass got, but you cannot tell me that man do not got her ass in bondage. And that's what we need to be investigating while we around here spending all the Pentagon money trying to raid Diddy House for some thumb drives with him hunching Carl Winslow on it. That girl has been held against her will. She has been forced to wear them clothes. And at the point in which, and, and I'm not being funny, at the point in which she's walking around outside with no shoes on, why hasn't Adult Protective Services been called? An investigation needs to be launched. 
she is harming herself. She is harming herself and neither she nor the person she's with has the capacity to, 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 to take care of herself. And I'm not being funny. At the point at which you're walking around with no shoes on at a theme park, you are harming yourself. There needs to be an adult protective services case if it launched. Somebody need to look after her well-being, and it might as well be me or that custodian that got Wendy Williams money. Call the custodian. Uh, I'm saying the wrong word. Not the custodian. The conservator. Call the, the guardianship. Call the guardian people. Call the guardian people. She need a guardian. At the point at which a grown-ass woman is walking around Disneyland with no shoes on, she need a guardian. She she need a guardian and she needs somebody to watch over her money. I, I tell you this, I bet if we get somebody to watch over Kanye, Kanye money, his ass will get to acting right. Let me get off this line, y'all. I'm tired and I'm hungry. And I, you, you know how you be talking, you talk so much, your breath starts to stink. I just smelt my own breath. It, drinking this dick, because I'm only drinking water. Anyway, y'all. Don't get used to church running over and thinking we finna mic boo this thing over to a two-hour damn show. That's where it looked like it's going. But I'll call y'all hoes later. Bye.